الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب إليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فهو المهتد ومن يضل فلن تجد له وريا مرشدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا وقائدنا وقدوتنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم عبده ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وترك على المحجة البيضاء ليلها كنهارها لا يزيع عنها إلا هالك صلوات ربي والسلام عليه وعلى آله وصحبه الطيبين الطاهرين ومن سار على نهجه واختفى أثاره إلى يوم الدين All praise and thanks are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Peace and blessings of Allah be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam We bear witnesses that there is no one worthy of being worshipped except Allah and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and his final messenger the seal of the prophets sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to perfect the highest levels of manners and morals. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send his peace and blessings upon him, upon his companions and all of his righteous and true followers until the day of judgment. And say ameen that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likewise that we are amongst those people. That we are included in the company of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that we are granted his shafa'a. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not deprive us from that shafa'a, that intercession of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I begin with a verse in the Holy Quran whereabouts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in Surah Luqman, وَوَصَّيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنٍ وَفِصَالُهُ فِي عَامَيْنِ أَنِشْكُ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْكَ إِلَيَّ الْمَصِيرِ وَإِنْ جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَنْ تُشْرِكَ بِي مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطَعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا وَاتَّبِعْ سَبِيلَ مَنْ أَنَابَ إِلَيْهِ ثُمَّ إِلَيَّ مَرْجِعُكُمْ فَأُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ ويقول عز وجل في سورة الإسراء وقضى ربك أن لا تعبدوا إلا إياه وبالوالدين إحسانا إما يبلغن عندك الكبر أحدهما أو كلاهما فلا تقل لهما أف ولا تنهرهما وقل لهما قولا كريما ويقول في نهاية الآيات أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإما تعرضن عنهم ابتغاء رحمة من ربك ترجوها فقل لهم قولا ميسورا My brothers and sisters in Islam these verses and so many verses of their alike explain and shed the light upon a very unique very sacred, very important relationship. And this relationship is one of the most direct relationship between any two human beings. The relationship of the parents to the children and the other way around. Alaqat. 
الآباء والأمهات بأولادهم والعكس. So it is a relationship that is سبحان الله uh, to the contrary or or to uh, the wide misunderstanding or misunderstood conception that is سبحان الله يعني that is very uh, very general in a lot of times a rela this relationship between the parents and the children it is not a one way street as many people think it is not a relationship first and foremost that that starts from the time of the birth of the child or when the child reaches the age of 7 or if the or when the child becomes basically mature enough to understand the right and the wrong and the halal and the haram uh, when they reach the age of puberty and it does not start when the child is a young adult it actually starts way before that this relationship starts from the time that a young man and a young woman they start seeking that halal that permissible relationship that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referred to in the Quran as nikah, meaning that they're looking forward to establish a family. So the relationship between the children and the parents begin from the time when that man or the father to be starts seeking the righteous or the, or the right match for himself to be the mother of his children. And from the time that the young lady starts accepting proposals or entertaining proposals from fit men who are, who are strong, healthy, responsible, reliable, and trustworthy. Exactly the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described it in the Holy Quran when he spoke about Musa alayhi salam. Al-Qawi Al-Amin. He had two qualities. That is the quwa. In khayra man istajart al Al-Amin. That the best that you the person that you can hire. This is one of the two young ladies who was who was basically making a proposal or suggestion to her father about Musa alayhi salam and hiring him. That she witnessed or that she noticed two qualities in him. That is the strength, the physical strength. Meaning that he's a person who's responsible. He's not a couch potato. He's a man who can earn and who can establish and support a family, right? And on the other hand, al-amana, the trustworthiness. That's the second quality. So the relationship between parents and children begin from that time. And this is subhanAllah, this relationship is so, so deep and so dynamic that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this relationship between the parents and the children in the stories of so many prophets and messengers in the Quran. To begin with the story of Nuh alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to this relationship between a father and his child. When the son, the son of Nuh alayhi salam was battling the heavy waves that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent in response to the dua of Nuh alayhi salam. Nuh alayhi salam was sailing in the ark or on the ark with the very few numbers of believers and the animals that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded to bring with. وَهِيَ تَجْرِبِهِمْ فِي مَوْجٍ كَالْجِبَالِ وَنَادَى نُوحُ نِبْنَهِ And Nuh calls upon his son. وَكَانَ فِي مَعْزِلِ uh, he was basically on uh, in a corner fighting the the waves of the water ya bunayyar kam ma'ana wa la takum ma'al kafirin the reason why i'm mentioning this is so that we understand as children of our fathers and mothers so we can understand what our parents go through so that you understand what your father has for you what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instilled from the love and the compassion and the care and the protection that your father has for you even after you get married, even after you have children who are 
the grandchildren of your father. Nuh alayhi salam is calling upon his, his adult son and he's telling him, my son, come aboard. Come aboard. Ya bunayya kam ma'na wa la takum ma'al kafirin. Do not be amongst the disbelievers. Don't drown in your sins and disobedience. And we do have sometimes, my brothers and sisters in Islam, some children in nowadays life who actually act just like the son of Nuh acted. In arrogance, in denial, in defiance. Just like the son of Nuh did. He responded arrogantly to his father and he said, I'm not in need of your advice. I'm going to take refuge and protection on top of a hill or a mountain. That will protect me from these waves. There is no protection today except with the mercy of Allah. Nothing will protect you, my dear. Right? And there are some children who act as if that they know everything. When the father advises them to do something. Uh, when the father, because of the experience that he had. Or when the mother gives an advice, renders an advice. Because of the challenges that she faced in her life. The son or the daughter acts all. Uh, acts as if that they know it all. And they start basically talking back and putting down their parents and the opinion of the parents, it's okay to disagree, but it's not right and it's not appropriate, it's not acceptable to be disrespectful to your parents. Nuh alayhi salam goes on, he does not give up, even after he saw with his own naked eyes the drowning of his son. Could you imagine? He's sailing and he sees his adult son in defiance, refusing, rejecting the call of Nuh alayhi salam, his own father. And he saw him drowning. He was, he was done. He drowned. Despite that, Nuh alayhi salam, even though he knew that he died as a kafir, he did not lose hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fatherly love did not stop him from asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, let's be honest with each other. If Iblis did not lose hope in the mercy of Allah, even after he was cursed and, and casted out, uh, look at that. He asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for respite, for a chance. A chance meaning that to give him a life, you know, until the day of judgment. Allah gave it to him because he asked. You simply need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether Allah gives it to you or not, that's between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah knows and you do not know. So he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, called upon Allah. The father who's, who's basically subhanallah, whose heart was wrenching because he saw his son drowning. Not just physically, but also he saw his son dying and drowning in his sins, in his kufr, in his disbelief. So he called upon Allah and he said, that the son of mine who drowned in front of my eyes, he's part of me. He's my flesh, he's my blood. And your promise is, is, is always sacred. So Allah responded to him that he's no longer considered your family. That's it, it's over. Because of the disbelief, this is, it's a separation, it's a barrier. Do not ask me that which you do not have no knowledge of, subhanAllah. When we talk about the relation between parents and children, you also have to quickly look at the motherly love and compassion and affection that, subhanAllah, yani after Allah, there is no equivalence to that kind of love, wallahi. And that is prevalent in the story of Musa alayhi salam when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the, the mother of Musa alayhi salam inspires her to put her newborn baby Musa into the basket and throw him into the river and she's told that he will be in the hands of his enemy who is seeking to kill him. 
And despite that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives her the assurance and the promise that he will be safe and he will be returned and he will be a prophet and a messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna radduhu ilayki wa ja'aluhu minal mursaleen. Despite that, the mother is a mother. Not that she didn't trust Allah, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was showing us uh, what's in the heart of the mother for her children. The anxiousness, the love, you wouldn't understand. You will never understand why your mother gets so anxious. Even after you grow up, even after you become a teenager, even if you think that the phone calls of your mother are actually embarrassment for you because you're too cool, right? You're too cool, you're, you're, you're old enough. Huh? Or you are basically above the age that your mother should be checking on you because you have cool friends, right? It's a reality. There are some youngsters, some, some young adults, whether, you know, men or women, that's how they act. They think they're too cool, that their parents shouldn't be embarrassing. It's an embarrassment. Oh, what, mom, why are you calling me? Why do you keep calling me? Come on. You know, I'm just, just chilling with my friends, having a coffee, and I'm just checking on you, making sure you're okay. And I tell you what, I tell you what, I am almost 49, 50 years old, and my mother still calls me and checks on me. I have children. She still calls and checks on me. And there's nothing wrong with that, as long that it is not something that is what, that is filled with obsession. Wallah, I tell you one thing. If you are a young man or a young woman whose mother or whose father is checking on them, you should be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the day will come, Wallahi, you will miss that call. Wallahi, you will, you will regret the fact that you, will not, you, that you are not appreciating that phone call from your mother. Because as soon as your mom or your dad passes away from this life, guess what? One of the gates between you and Allah are closed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings back Musa alayhi salam to her, not just because he promised to do so. Allah mentions another reason before that, more important than the promise he gave. That's the main reason. A lot of people don't pay attention to that. The main reason was so that to comfort the empty heart of that mother. Because of her. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could, could no longer basically subhanallah leave the mother in that level of anxiety and worry. She couldn't hold it. She was about to disclose the whole scenario. إن كادت لتبدي به لولا أربطنا على قلب لتكون وقالت لأخته قصي look سبحان الله she couldn't take it she sent her daughter to go and check and hear and bring news what's happening to her son to the baby son is he okay is he fine is he nursing or no and Allah سبحانه وتعالى brought her back brought him back to her so when we talk about the relationship between parents and and children my brothers and sisters we got to understand that like any other relationship, this relationship has to be what? Has to be balanced. It has to be a leveled, balanced relationship. There has to be a discipline in it. So there is no ifrat and tafrid. And in other words, this relationship has to be fulfilled from both sides. But to the surprise of many of us, Imam ibn al-Qayyim, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon him, he says, he says, ذكر بعض العلماء أن الله سبحانه وتعالى يسأل الوالد عن ولده قبل أن يسأل الولد عن والده. That in the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa taala asks the parents about their children first before He asks the children about the parents. Why? The answer lies in the following story: A man who reached an old age comes to Umar al-Khattab in the time of his Khilafah. He approaches Umar and, and he, he complains. He submits a complaint against his son, who is an, who is an adult, and says, Ibn Aq, that my son is what? 
is somebody who is who is basically not being kind, not being you know he's not fulfilling his duties towards me at this old age that I am in. So Amr al Khattab radiallahu summons the the adult son, brings him forth, and he tells him, "Woe to you! Destruction to you! Your father is complaining. Look, he's an old man, and he is complaining that you are not fulfilling." Your duties towards your father? Aren't you ashamed? Look. So the son respectfully asks Umm Khattab radiallahu a simple question. He says, O oh, the Khalifa of Rasulullah or O oh, Amir al Mu'mineen, are there any rights that I have upon my father? Are there any rights that I have upon him or no? So he says, Of course. And he mentions the three foundational rights. Number one, he says, An yuhsin ikhtiyara ummik that he, he he's careful and selective when he uh, gets married. When we get married, what do we think about? We think about ourselves, right? Oh, I want her like this, I want her to be, you know, this tall, this, this you know, this beautiful, or, or from this, you know, she has to have a status. But Umar Khattab is explaining another important aspect of the relationship between the wife and the husband, that is, that includes the children. So when you're marrying a woman, this is directed to the young brothers. When you're marrying a woman, you got to think that you are actually marrying the mother of your children. That's the way you're supposed to think. This is one of the rights of your children to be born upon you. That's what Umar Khattab said. And you have ikhtiyar ummi. Number two, and you have ikhtiyar ismik that he gives you, that your father, your parents give you a good name. And number three, and you alimak al Quran that it is a duty upon your parents, upon your father, because he's responsible financially for providing for you, for your food and drink and everything that he teaches you. And if he cannot, that's absolutely fine. There are many parents who do not have the time or the capacity or the knowledge to teach their children. He has to hire someone, right? That's where the school comes in, right? So the, the young man looks at Umar Khattab and he says, by Allah, ya Amir al muminin he did not fulfill even one of these three rights. He's talking about his father. He says, not even one. He said, as for my mother, she's illiterate. She's a maid. As for my name, he called me Ju'al. And in Arabic, Ju'al means a bug that lives off garbage. That's the name he gave him. And number three, as for teaching me, he said, Wallahi, he did not teach me even a single letter of the Quran, let alone the other, the rest. So, Amr Khattab, He's known, he doesn't, you know, there's no wishy-washiness with Amr al-Khattab. He looked at the, the man who complained to him and he gave him the answer. He said, you know what? You know why your son is doing this to you now? He said, it's a payback time. It's a payback time because you neglected him in his childhood. Now Allah is causing him to neglect you right now. At when, you're, when you are at an old age. كَمَا تُدِينُ تُدَان أَقَكْتَهُ فِي الصِّغَرْ فَأَقَكَ فِي الْكِبَرْ you neglected him in his childhood. You did not bring him up properly. You didn't take care of him. Now he's paying you back. On the other hand, my brother and sister Islam, I can share with you the other side. SubhanAllah, the fruitfulness, the amazing reward that one would get if you're kind to your parents, especially to your mother. One day the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu as Aisha radiallahu anha wa radaha narrated, she narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a dream. Ra'a fil manam annahu fil jannah. He saw himself, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in jannah. And he, when he was in jannah, he started hearing a beautiful voice, a melodic voice, reciting the Quran. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was amazed and he asked the angels, Man hadha? Who is this man? Who is this beautiful voice? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, is very 
uh, keen to know who is this person who is reciting the, the Quran so beautifully in Jannah, in the gardens of Jannah. The answer came back that this is one of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad His name is Al-Haritha ibn Al-Nu'man. May Allah be pleased with him. Al-Haritha ibn Al-Nu'man, radiyallahu anhu arlah. The Prophet وسلم, as soon as he heard the answer, he said, and this is the narration of Aisha radiyallahu anhu arlah, he said, كذلكم البر, كذلكم البر. That this is, this is the fruitful result of being kind and caring and compassionate towards the mother. And the Prophet repeated it several times. And then he ended and he said, وَكَانَ أَبَرَّ النَّاسِ بِأُمِّي That Hartha ibn Nu'man, may Allah be pleased with him, who became or who embraced Islam on the hands of Mus'ab Mus ibn radiallahu anhu the ambassador of the Prophet sallam. He was amongst those who were outstandingly kind to his mother, to the extent that when she reached an old age, he used to feed her every meal with his hands. He used to feed his mother by himself. He did not hire a maid, he did not bring a nurse, he did not put her in a nursing home. He used to take care of her by himself. He used to feed her by himself. And he would not question anything that she would ask him to do. لا يستفهم ما تقوله أمه أبدا من البر بها For some people, they might think that this is, come on, Sheikh, this is too much. This is beyond our capacity. We can't do this. Uh, we're too cool for this kind of thing right now. Uh, I'm too busy. Well, guess what? The busier they get in this life, the more chances and opportunities you are losing. So, going back, my brothers and sisters, to the relationship between the parents and the children, it's a two-way relationship. And I'm going to quickly shed the light upon some forms of, subhanAllah, of neglect and abuse that could happen from some parents. One of the brothers approached me a couple of weeks ago and he said, Sheikh, you know, you guys always talk about the right of the children, the right of the children. The system here, the, everything is against the parents. Our hands are tied. We can't do anything, right? But at the same time, I was in system Islam. There are some parents who are actually, let alone the land of the law, they are not even respecting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are not even respecting Allah when it comes to the right of their children. There are some parents, unfortunately, who are abusing their children physically and mentally and emotionally. There are some parents who are actually bullying their children, putting them down. I've seen it myself. I've heard it myself. And many of us, my brothers and sisters, they have heard, you know, stories across the board of how parents actually bully their own children and put them down. When a child wants to speak or say something or give an opinion, shut them off. Don't let them talk. It doesn't work that way. That's not the way you teach. That's not the way that you set an example. And on the other hand also, when they reach an old age, when they start reaching that age of adulthood, my boss and sister Sam, one of the other forms of oppression or abuse that's exercised by, by some parents, and again, I repeat and emphasize some, may Allah not make us amongst them. When there's a proposal for their daughter, they keep refusing it for lame excuses. Uh, he's not from Pakistan like I am. Uh, he's not an Arab. We've got to make sure that we are from the same, you know, from, from the same basically, uh, same background. It actually gets even uglier than that. There are some who refuse uh, and keep refusing proposals after proposals, even though the proposals are coming from fit men, from responsible men, from men who are God-fearing, and they are, they are, they are very uh, compatible to their daughters. They keep refusing. Why? Because the daughter is working. She is a money-making machine. There we go, another reason. And we have heard also the story of the sister 
who reached the age of 40 and the father was refusing to marry her off. And when he was about to die, she comes to him and in front of people, he's in his last moments, she raises her hand and she says, may Allah deprive you from Jannah, my father. The way that you deprived me from having children. Yes. You gotta be careful. This is dhulm. Just the fact that you're father or mother, you, that doesn't mean, it does not mean that you oppress uh, or parents who do not treat their children equally. And when it comes to the matters of this life, love is different. Nobody can control that. You can love one of them more than the other, but you cannot treat them differently. Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salatu wa salam ala ibadihi al-ladhin as-safa thumma ma ba'd. The conclusion, my brothers and sisters, Islam, the relationship between the parents and the children. It's, it's a very dynamic relationship. It's, it's a relationship that ought to be established on mutual respect. You want respect, you have to give it. You want kindness, you have to give it so you can have it back. And yani, subhanAllah, yani, one of the be most beautiful verses in the Quran, in Surah Al-Kahf, وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا Look at that, subhanAllah, because of the righteousness and, the, and, and because of the God consciousness of a great grandfather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his servant Musa alayhi salam with Al-Khidr alayhi salam to go and fix that wall beneath which there was a what? There was a treasure left behind for two orphans, subhanAllah. Look at that. So in other words, your righteousness, your closeness to Allah will benefit your children and vice versa. If you leave behind children who are brought up properly, daughters who are brought up properly, sons who are, daughter, who are brought up properly, and you gave them their rights, wallahi, you have to rest assured that they will pay you back, even after your death. Because the relationship between you and them does not cut off at the end of this life. It actually carries on. Uh, the dua of the children, the dua of your righteous children is one of the, subhanAllah, the amazing forms that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ha have kept for you. And it's a treasure. And in fact, in the day of judgment, the father or the mother will be brought in front of Allah. They will be standing and expecting a very severe and a very difficult and a very challenging accountability. Tough times. And the angels will bring mountains of good deeds. Jibal min al hasanat. So the, the, the man and the woman, uh, the father or the mother, they, they will wonder, they're, what is this? I don't remember doing all this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell you as a father, as a mother, this is because of This is because of your son or your daughter praying for you. This is because your son or your daughter asks Allah for forgiveness for you. This is the result. Allah keeps the dua for your parents and will reward them with it in the day of judgment, subhanAllah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us a good relationship with our parents and our children. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who are good parents and amongst those who are good children. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to be amongst those who follow the footsteps of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And may he subhanahu wa ta'ala make us not amongst those who are tested and trialed by their children or their parents. صلوا على الرسول الكريم وما بعوث رحمة للعالمين فقد أمركم الله بذلك في كتاب الكريم فقال عز من قال إن الله ملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وأنا مع عبدك ورسولك محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم اغفر لنا ولوالدينا أجمعين اللهم ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم 
ربنا ظلمنا انفسنا وان لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاسرين عباد الله ان الله يامر بالعدل والاحسان وايتاء ذي القربى وان عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله الجليل العظيم يذكركم واشكروا على نعمه ولا يزدكم ولا ذكر الله اكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون واقم الصلاه الله اكبر الله اكبر اشهد ان لا اله الا الله